bring them out, bring them out, bring them out, bring them out. It's hard to yell when the barrel's in your mouth. Come on. Bring them out, bring them out. Bring them out. Hey, y'all, what's good? Welcome to the Mic Check Podcast. This is your boy T Word, aka the People's Champ, here with my co host, my partner in words, Quentin Dame Lilly. What's good with you, Dame? What's up, man? What's going on, y'all? Everybody out there, appreciate y'all tuning in. First episode in a long time, but we're yes, back. You know, it's, yes, been, it's been about five years, man. It's hard to believe it's been about five years <laughs> something like this. But you know, the it cool has. about uh, taking time off and kind of getting there. To, to regroup and come back together, I think is um, you get to see the development between two individuals when they go and they do their own thing and then they get to come back. And do it. So love, love my man T love you, man. I'm always here for yeah. you. Whatever you need. It's, it's great that we get to do this again. We've been talking about this for about a year. So it's been great Absolutely. you know that this is finally getting to really happen. So here we are, man, we back. Yeah. I want to piggyback off that and say, yeah, it, it's, it's been a long time coming. Um, formerly of the, the Quality Talk radio show at UITA Radio so many moons ago. Um, we was just kind of fresh face and just getting into the game. But over these years, we've learned a lot, and we're happy to come back and share those experiences. Like Q said, we're just happy to bring it back. And, and who better to do it with than your brother? You know what I'm saying? He's like my my um, my little big brother. You know what I'm no saying? Because he's like six foot nine or something like that. <laughs> so it's good to see my brother, man, and be able to connect. And uh, even over distance, we always able to chop it up on sports, whether it's basketball, football, boxing, and track and field if need be. If it's sports related, we're both tapped in. Uh, we got all the streams. We pay for the fights. You know what I'm saying? So we are supporters of the things that we enjoy. So we want to put that out there. We're really true sports fans. So it's a pleasure to get back to it. But um, all, all that melancholy and all that, we're we going to put that on the side. We're going to get to some real sports okay. talk today. Yeah. And um, we've got some football topics. We, we both really enjoy and love boxing. Um, so we're going to talk about that. And we definitely want to talk about basketball, you know, in this early part of the season and stuff. So let's get right into some football. And, man, one thing that's kind of surprised me this year is the Philadelphia Eagles and their success. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of shocked that they're this good. And I hate that my New Orleans Saints not only gave them one of our better players from a motivational standpoint, but they also have our first round pick coming up. But that aside, this team is really streaking and really doing well in some games that maybe people thought they wouldn't win. So it's kind of hard to think about what team can truly challenge the Eagles in the NFC. So I'm going to throw it to you, bro. And um. Kind of tell me what you think about that. You know, man, it's tough really to say because I think the NFC is in a really weird space this year because in years past, there's been the top two or three teams, right? You knew kind of going into the season in the NFC who the powers were going to be. When Tom Brady went to the Bucks, it was going to be the Buccaneers. When, uh, yeah. uh, when Stafford went to the Rams last year, you knew the Rams were going to be up in there. You know, when right. – uh, when Aaron Rodgers was on top of his game, you knew that the Packers were going to be in there to contend. And this is one of those years, oddly enough, where all three of those teams are really, really struggling. I mean, the Packers yeah. got a big win yesterday beating the Cowboys. Um, but you take that with a grain of salt when you look at the entirety of their season, you look at how they played entirely. It just really seems like the NFC is really, really wide open. And it seems like Philly mm -hmm. is really taking advantage of that right now, for sure. Absolutely. I, I'm going to agree with you there and say that Philly does seem to be the team to beat. Um, obviously, they have the best record, but also you have a lot of teams. The NFL's been looking for parity for a long time, and they finally got it in the NFC, whereas it used to be you've got your top five, and you could pretty much make a top five team, your, your, your four division winners, and then that, that first wild card team, and you could be pretty close to accurate without much thought every year. This year, you don't have that luxury. Um, just for example, the New Orleans Saints, um, a lot of people thought, oh, Sean Payton had an injured team last year. Uh, that team just struggled because of injuries, and they had four different starting quarterbacks and still won nine games. They're bringing back almost that entire nucleus, and they're getting a fresh start in the coaching department and look at this team, barely amounting three wins. Um, you look around the NFC, you've got surprise teams like the Giants on the other side of that coin that nobody saw coming, and I believe the Giants are 6-2 and two right now. So when you start to think about who can challenge you start within their division. Dallas could sneak up on the Eagles and, and give them a real push. Maybe not necessarily for the division, but definitely make it hard for them to finish with that number one seed with yeah. some type of strategic losses late in the season. You've also got the Giants in that mix. Um, 
You can't look past these teams that have just enough kryptonite for the Eagles. I would think that I kind of liken this current Eagles team to that Ravens team that Lamar Jackson led that went 14-2 and two, and then in the playoffs that had struggles because once you were able to shut down the most key element of Lamar's game, that team really had nowhere else to go besides that run game. And I kind of see some similarities in Philly, except I think they're better on defense, which will help them get a little deeper in the playoffs. What do you think about that element of it as far as the similarities between those two teams? You know, I think that's a really interesting uh, comparison that you make in there. You know, a team with a running quarterback, that's maybe not the most prolific passer. Um, mm -hmm. Lamar and Jalen Hurts do have that in common for sure. I think the mm -hmm. one thing I could probably say that is probably going to be slightly different that remains to be seen is I'm looking here at the schedule that the Eagles have played this uh, so far this season. And honestly, their best win is a week two win over the Vikings. Now, it didn't mm -hmm. seem like much of a win at the time because the Vikings have gone on to win eight straight games since that game that they beat uh, the mm -hmm. Vikings back in September. Uh, I think they, they won the game 24 to 7, the Eagles did. But really, when you look at the rest of the teams that they've beaten, you know, on the road against Washington, Jacksonville, Arizona. They beat Dallas when Cooper Rush was still playing and Dak was out. They beat mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's really been struggling. They beat the Texans last week, and then they're going to yeah. be playing again to, uh, tonight. So yeah, Washington. you kind of you, you kind of got to look at the schedule as a whole and realize, okay, if I had to grade it on an A to F rating on as far as difficulty of schedule, yeah. they're right in that C range, that C-plus range on schedule right now. Because really the only really playoff contending team that they've beaten with their whole team was Minnesota. Now Minnesota yeah. just came off a huge win yesterday. So really yeah, they're absolutely. I mean that's that's a huge win. And that makes the Eagles look even better because now they're saying, well, we dominated this team in week two. And this is it's the yeah. same team that just beat the Bills, who a lot of people are high on in the AFC, which is gonna lead us to our next topic. But overall, realistically, I think the Eagles are definitely a team to beat. Uh, uh, reckon with mm -hmm. for anything, just for the simple fact that a great running game is something that can transfer and it can translate. It, ne it doesn't matter what you play. It doesn't matter what the weather's like. It doesn't matter if it's indoor, outdoor. It doesn't matter. If you can run the ball, you're yeah. going to be able to control the clock, control down and distance, and you're going to be able to dictate terms to a great offense. And a lot of these other teams, that's what they rely on in the NFC is going to be scoring more points than you. The Eagles have the versatility Absolutely slow the game down and I think that's going to help them a lot. Okay, I could agree with that. Um, and we're going to move on to the next point um, that you did mention the Bills. So let's talk about the AFC and potential division winners. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to the NFC at a later time, but I definitely want to talk about the AFC a little bit. And who do you see at this point? You know, we're, we're about half, just a little over halfway through. Who do you see winning the divisions in the AFC? Um, let's start with the West. I mean, the West is, for me, was probably the easiest pick. Uh, yeah. And to me, it's Kansas City. Kansas City is head and shoulders above everybody else in that division. And realistically, yeah. it's because of two people. It's because of Patrick Mahomes. And it's because mm -hmm. of Andy Reid. Um, yeah. And I'll even throw Eric Bieniemy in that, too, because Eric Bieniemy is a huge reason why they've been able to get to the leaps and bounds as an offense. So I'm yeah. going to definitely give him his credit, too, uh, especially being my brother in the West Coast. Shout out to everybody yeah. on the West Coast. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Kansas City is Kansas City is, is always going to have a chance because yeah. they have that trio. They have those two coaches. They got that quarterback. And they're just able yeah. to make things happen in the worst of situations. I think they've had four games now this year that they've won being down by 10 points or more in the, at some point in the second half. So they're never out of it. You can't ever, you know, you can't ever sleep on them. And I don't think anybody is going to be sleeping on them come playoff time this year. I have Kansas City coming out of the West as well for a lot of the same reasons. I also think that for whatever reason, Kansas City's defense knows how to turn it on late in the year. So I feel like some of those games that they're struggling to keep the score down, they're going to start to average back to that to that that strong defense that you typically see late in the season for Kansas City. It's just like they're playmakers, they're pass rushers. When teams start to rely a little bit more on the run because it's getting cold, they have a good run defense most of the time, and then they're able to pick up on the pass defense side. So I kind of expect the same thing. Let's talk about the AFC East and the aforementioned Bills. Um, that's going to be my pick. Even though the Jets are looking really good and the Dolphins are strong, I still have the Bills because I think they can run the ball. They have such diversity at quarterback 
with Josh Allen. And as long as he's able to kind of get over his little bit of slump and, and, and injuries that's kind of catching up with him a little bit because of his play style, I think that's going to be the team to beat coming out of the AFC in general until you get deep into the second and third round of playoffs. Yeah, man. I mean, this is a debate show. We're here to talk about our difference of opinions on things, but I think you, you, you know, we're, we're in lockstep right now. When you talk about the bills, the bills being the AFC yeah. leader, I mean, the one thing I can say about the bills is that they're kind of like Kansas city in a way where they just figure out how to win games that they probably shouldn't win. Um, mm-hmm. They got the ability to uh, make timely plays on defense while not being yeah. a quote unquote great defense. They make timely plays when needed. And then also Mm -hmm. they have a reliable quarterback that they know is going to make plays, that's going to move the ball, that's going to get the ball around to players that are open. And that's the one thing I can say that Josh Allen really stepped his game up into last year was not only looking for digs in key situations, but bringing all the other guys along with him, right? Knox, great tight end. He loves getting it to him in, you know, uh, uh, in the red zone, you know. And one thing I will say that they probably do need to uh, clear up in my opinion, moving forward just for the health of Josh Allen is to really work on trying to get a consistent run game out of somebody other than him. Because for sure. You keep putting this guy in harm's way. 6'5", yeah. 245, runs like – He's a big target. He's a great part of your offense. He's a great element to have as a part of your run game. But when you start fully relying on him to be your leading passer and your leading rusher on a week-to-week yeah. basis – you're continuing to put him on harm's way. You're going to get him nicked up eventually. So that's yeah. probably the one thing I would say they need to do to try to clean up that. But otherwise, man, I mean, Von Miller's a huge pickup. It hurt me to see him for leave sure. for my Rams because I knew how much <laughs> he was with us last year. You know? He's that dude. He was a one-year rental, so we appreciate yeah. Von. Thank you, man, for the ring. We you got the ring out of it. You got the, you ring, got the out ring out of it, it so it works. You know? So yeah. I'm not complain, but I will say that he's made a big difference in a lot of big games already. And Von Absolutely. does his best work in the playoffs. So yes, yes, sir. He knows how to turn it on. He's a 12-year vet. He knows what he's doing. Let's go ahead and switch to the AFC North. Um, who do you see coming out of North? I mean, the North was probably the <laughs> most difficult one for me to decide because it's like picking between, you know, the conventional way that people win games, which is, yeah. you know, uh having multiple weapons at multiple locations, right? Uh, when you talk about the Bengals, right? You talk about Joe Burrow, you know, cl- classic pocket quarterback that can move, distributes mm-hmm. the ball extremely well, smart guy, quick reads, great, uh, great offensive mind in him himself. You know, you got mm-hmm. Jamar Chase, you got T. Higgins, you got Tyler Boyd, you got Tyler numerous Boyd. weapons, not even to yeah. mention quarterbacks, Joe Mixon. You know, you, you talk about a number of guys that they have to kind of really just be a well rounded offense. But then I was kind yeah. of also because the Ravens have really been playing really, really well. And I think yeah. ultimately the team that I went with was the Ravens. Reason being is I just think this is the year that Lamar proves the doubters wrong, right? Joe Burrow had that year in mm-hmm. college. He had that year last season where the Bengals mm-hmm. were, you know, the, the Bungles, right? They were a team that never could get over the hump. They hadn't won a playoff game in 22 years or something crazy like that, right? He finally got over the hump. He got his team to the Super Bowl. They weren't able to cash in ultimately. But he did what he was supposed to do. And I kind of see a little bit of a Super Bowl slump for them happening right now. So my pick is the Ravens, Lamar Jackson, the run game. Uh, he's improved as a passer. So that's who I went with to win the to win the division in the AFC. Like you said, lock and step, bro. Um, that one's kind of elementary, you know, for that division where you kind of know what teams have the best likelihood because I can't pick a winner. But the best likelihood is between the Ravens and the Bengals because they have the tools. The Ravens have the defense and the run game to support them late in the season when they need it. Um, And the Bengals have the offense to give those type of teams hell, especially where the NFL has set it up to where a lot of division games are coming late in the year. Now we're going to venture down to the NFC South before we jump over into some boxing. I'm sorry, the AFC South. And um, I've got Tennessee uh, just because of all the tools that are there. It's it's really, you know, like the AFC is kind of like black and white. So it's not like there's a lot to debate there. So I'm not I'm not going to hold you. And I, I feel like you're probably thinking the same thing. But that's of right now. If we talk again in three weeks, we might have varying opinions because a lot of things have changed over three weeks. But I'm going to throw it to you. AFC South, who you got? Yeah, man. I mean, I'm, I'm picking the Titans and I'm picking the Titans only for one reason, man. Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry. Yeah. Man. Same. He's, <laughs> he's, 
He's he's literally like he's like the sun that this AFC South division revolves around, right? It's how can yeah. we get through this guy? How can we get this guy off the field? How can we keep their mm-hmm. offense from getting rolling in that snowball effect? I mean, the Titans are not a flashy team. They're not a team that you want to mm-hmm. click your TV to on, you know, prime ticket to watch. You know, right. you're, not, you're not racing to go and watch them play every week. But every week sure. you look at the scoreboards, you look at the highlights at the end of the week, and they won another game. 18 to 15, they won another game, 24 and 19. They, you know, they, they find ways to win low scoring games to keep mm-hmm. the game within reach. And it was really right. interesting because I thought when Tannehill got hurt that the backup, and I, I don't know why I can't think of the dude's name right now, Malik, um, I can't think of his name, but the backup who, who filled in for Tannehill for the last, I think, two weeks, I really yeah. thought that going to be the opportunity for them to catapult into being a team that you wanted to watch, but he had right. some real struggles those first two games that he's played, and rightfully so. I mean, you know, you can't expect yeah, we're just to expected. Come in right. unexpected and just hit the ground running, but right. we can't go back this past week, um, you know, it seems like they're heading in the right direction, so I have to go with the Titans. I mean, they're in a very, mm-hmm. very bad division. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> divisions that are down right now, but when you talk yeah. about Colts having their issues with Matt Ryan. You talk about, you know, Jacksonville still being Jacksonville. And then you talk about, um, you know, the Titans really kind of, you know, stabilizing the Texans. Texans, I mean, the Texans are on their own. So, I mean, the Titans are the clear pick, you know, out of the, out of the bad bunch, so to speak. So that's, that's definitely why I have the Titans. For sure. Now, before we move into our next group of topics, which is going to be boxing, uh, I do want to let you all know that, we're going to be a bi-weekly show. Um, we're going to be putting out episodes every Wednesday or Thursday, more than likely Thursdays. We're going to get these out to you. Um, so we want to try and make sure that we cover all the week's news leading up to our show. So be sure to tune in each week. Obviously, right here is going to be on YouTube. There'll be links all over our social media for you to check us out. So be sure to support, like and follow the page, share it with your friends. Uh, we're going to give you the best takes that you can find, man, because we're going to keep it real, even when we disagree. Now, that being said, we're going to get into some boxing and let's each give our top three up and coming prospects. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with you first, you know, um, because I, I, I can modify my list a little bit because I don't want us to get too redundant with it. And, and I feel like you're going to give some prospects that maybe I just haven't got on my radar yet. So top three, pros- top three prospects, any weight class. Now, here's what I'll say, man. I mean, when you talk about prospects, right, there's a line, right? There's a line between being a prospect, being a contender, and then being a world title challenger or an elite level boxer. So when I For think sure. of prospects, hands down, the best prospects out right now come from top rank. They just do. Fact. Top Fact. rank has, especially when you talk about American prospects, they have American prospects on lock. And it really seems like they are miles ahead of everybody else when it comes to investing in their prospects, putting their pos- mm-hmm. prospects on major shows where they're being seen on TV, not just non-TV undercard fights, but they're putting them right. in mainstream platforms. They're putting them as co-main events. They're putting them as a third fight on the card. Um, top ranked hands down has it. So all three of the guys that I have that I've seen that I think are going to turn out to be great elite level boxers at some point are all top ranked fighters. When you talk about Jared Anderson, heavyweight prospect, okay. Toledo, Ohio, 6'4", 240, great feet, great power, can move, hits with either hand. I mean, he seems to really be a total package. Next, I mean, is Keyshawn Davis. Great, great Olympic pedigree. Uh, he's in the lightweight division right now, but he's a guy that I can definitely see moving from lightweight to super lightweight to welterweight yeah. and even possibly getting up to 154, five foot nine, great movement. He's with a great coach. He's getting trained and, you know, under the tutelage with Bud Crawford, with Bo Mack, you know, uh, in Colorado Springs. So he's around a lot of guys that are gym rats that really, really love boxing and love their craft. So I think that that's a great spot for him to be in. And then thirdly, the last guy is Xander Zayas. Xander Zayas is probably Mm -hmm. a prospect that you're going to see headline Madison Square Garden. and He's probably going to become that Miguel Cotto of this Uh, of this era, so to speak, because boxing has been missing a Puerto Rican superstar for probably 10 years. And the reason that they've been missing it is because all of the biggest fights in the early 2000s and in the 90s, 
a lot of those fights were a Puerto Rican against a Mexican. And a lot of yes. those fights did not happen because while Mexico has continued to produce a lot of high level guys, there has not been a Puerto Rican fighter that's been able to kind of transition and kind of uh, transcend into the mainstream era since Cotto. Agreed. Size Agreed. Is your guy. 154, great pedigree. He's a really good kid. And the great part about him, and probably the even craziest part, is the dude is only, I think, 20 years old. Yeah, he's, he's young, young, maybe 21. Yeah. Into a headlining act because he just had a headlining fight uh, about a month ago. And he's going to be back in December. And matter of fact, the yeah. ironic part about all three of these guys, all three of these guys are going to be on the same card December 10th on the Tiafimo uh, Jose Pedraza undercard. So it'll be a great night for everybody that hasn't checked them out to get to check them out because they'll all three be getting some mainstream uh, platform on ESPN. And and that card is only happening because Bob Aram is uh is petty. <laughs> well, I'm just kidding, in, but yeah. <laughs> in, in Bob's defense, the only thing I will say is is Bob has been doing Heisman Night cards for years. Mm-hmm. And to be yeah. honest with you, what you're getting at and what people might not be understanding what you're getting at is Terrence Crawford is supposed to be fighting the same night. Terrence Crawford yeah. and Bob had their issues before he left. I just think yeah. that, that was a bad call on Terrence's people's part trying to put yeah. the fight on that date because that's probably one of the only dates you don't want to compete with is Heisman night because for sure everybody watching ESPN for the Heisman award ceremony and that kind mm-hmm. of transition into that card. They've been doing that for like three or four years now. So, Oh, for but, sure. You know, it is what it is, man. He's going to get his check yeah. regardless. So he's not worried. He's he going to get paid no matter what, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, they've done a really good job of putting on great cards. Um, I'm going to jump into my prospects. Definitely. Keyshawn Davis is at the top of the list for me. Um, I've got Frank Martin on my list as a prospect mm-hmm. because I don't feel like he's in contender status no, as of yet. yet. Um, even though he's stepping up significantly against Michelle Rivera, uh, I believe it's supposed to be December 17th, the week after yeah. Keyshawn Davis. And I kind of see those guys on the collision course at 140 or 147 because they're both big lightweights. They're both mm-hmm. big dudes for that weight class. And you can see them kind of busting at the seams where – They're going to make their bones there early, may or may not win titles there, and they'll be moved up to 140 before they see a belt because people are going to dodge them because they're really strong competitors. Um, I do like your mention of Xander Zayas, and I'm really high on him. I think he was supposed to headline that big Puerto Rican Day card that they had several months ago, but he was injured. Yeah, he was injured. He got sick. He had like some kind of uh, infection. It was uh, was wasn't COVID, but it was some other issue he had. And I remember they, you know, they rescheduled him. And then he fought uh, about three, four weeks ago now. So he's, he's, yeah, he's yeah. going to be back. And that's the one thing I will say, man. I mean, for all three of the guys that I mentioned, what I'm loving is that they're active, right? They're Super two, active, yeah. They're fighting two, three, four times in the same year. And that's what you have to do when you're at 10-0, and 12-0, and 6-0, and 13-0. and You got to be fighting on a regular basis in order to, number one, create the following, number two, create mm-hmm. the demand, and number three, to improve your own self as an individual. I think a lot of these other guys, it seems like they're having issues staying active, and that's kind of stunning their growth when they get to that that world title contention. Agreed, one hundred percent. My last one is going to be Jared Anderson as well, um, and I just I like his game. I love that he believes in his abilities, but he's smart. He's not a cocky fighter, but he's a confident fighter, and that's really important from a technical standpoint. His footwork is awesome. Um, like you said, he's got power in both hands, and he uses his feet and the ring well to set up his shots. He's This isn't him just overpowering guys, and he's just being a pressure fighter. This is him setting up backhand uppercuts, you know, different little things like that that you don't see from bigger dudes. And yeah. he's bringing that, you know, because when you think about a big fighter, you just think about overwhelming pressure and power, and he's not just that. He's not a one-trick pony, and that gives him the ability to have longevity in the heavyweight division because he's – He's, he's a massive individual who can move, and he's young. Because I think he's only about, what, 24? He's 24. He's between, I think he's either between 22 and 24. I haven't looked it up his age, but he's yeah, definitely he's young. Still, he has a lot of time to grow. And the great part about heavyweights is that they really don't even hit their stride. Really, a lot of heavyweights until they're around 30. When you really For think sure. about all of the, the lighter weights, those guys get their best fights between they peak early. 22 to 27. But heavyweights, mm-hmm. heavyweights hit their stride when they get to be about 28, 29, 30, which is where all of the elite level boxes we're talking about are right now. When you talk about AJ, you talk about Fury, you talk about, you know, Wilder over the last couple of years, those guys all yeah. hit their peak really around the like mid thirties. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, we're going to jump into the next one here. And um, 
fighter of the year. Um, I'm I'm hesitant to even bring this topic up because I feel like it, this is too much of a love fest. I think we're gonna say the same thing, yeah. <laughs> but I'm gonna right. go first this time because right. I've got Dimitri Bivol because I've got him in two sensational wins and they were dominant wins. That's why I got to give it to him. Number one, the level of activity in his weight class is important. That's two fights in about six months time. Right. And, and he was dominant. He looked so cool, calm and relaxed. And it was like instant replay with the way that he competed in both fights, except against Zerto. He was a little bit more on the front because Zerto was trying to play on the back foot. So yeah. Other than that, it, it felt like he was fighting Canelo all over again. And once yeah. he takes your power and realize you're not going to drop him, he's going to get creative with what he's doing. I love his active high guard. So that's going to be my fighter of the year, and I'm standing on it. Yeah, man. Who you got? It's, it's crazy that we had no conversation about any of these topics, and it seems like we're just agreeing and we're kind of on lockstep right now. Soon that's going to change. I'm sure that it will change eventually sure. when we get to more topics. But, yeah, man, I mean, Dimitri Bivol is clearly fighter of the year. The only other person that I'm going to add, just because you've mentioned all the things about great things that Dimitri did, is I am going to add Bam Rodriguez into that mix. Oh, Bam man, man. yeah. Year. I mean, you beat two of the four kings at super flyweight. You got to understand, yeah. while people don't think that moving from 108 past 112 up to 115 is a big deal because people go from 140 to 147. When you're such yeah. a small individual, we're talking about guys between the heights of five three, five foot tall. When you yeah. add that much weight and you skip divisions, that's not done that's very lot. often. Especially right. when you talk about a guy who's 20, right? Mm -hmm. Who competing at 108. He was trying to get him get his feet wet at 108. He signs with Eddie Hearn in Matchroom. He gets a headlining fight on the zone. They offer him at last minute because I believe the fight he was uh, he was a, a late fill in against uh, mm -hmm. Carlos Quadras for the vacant WBC super flyweight title. He skips two weight divisions, comes in on three weeks notice and wins a belt and becomes yeah. an elite star. That's that's unheard of, man. I mean, for somebody that young, for somebody to be that well prepared, a lot of guys need at least a six week camp. We're talking about a guy that comes in on three weeks notice. He's able to headline that event, makes himself a, a, a world-known fighter now. He's definitely, definitely somebody to look forward to because, truth be told, he could just be a high-level prospect. But because of that great win, and then he turns around and he beats Sarissa Kat Sarong Visai uh, to defend the WBC title. I mean, he's yeah. definitely a guy that deserves mentioning, but you're not going to get an argument from me about Bevo. Bevo had two high-level wins, dominant fashion, yeah. didn't look like he sweated. I mean, it didn't look like he had anything worried to be worried about in either of those fights. The one thing I will say about B-Roll is that he's probably, in my opinion, and this can be just an added on topic, do you mm -hmm. think you know of a more complete fighter than B-Roll? Because I can't name one. Uh, uh, more complete in their prime? No. Yeah. Um, not right now. Not yeah. right now. Because he, he has every element. He uses different guards. His footwork is very efficient. Um, I mean, the only thing you could ask for is a little bit more pop in his bat, but yeah. that's that's just that's splitting hairs at that point. Like nobody has every single thing, especially at that weight class, like he does. Um, I think he is the most complete fighter that we've seen right now. And uh, without a whole lot of thought, I can't even pick another person. Um, one last one I want to throw in there. This is a quick hitter, and then we're gonna jump into some basketball before we get into our wrap up. But um, We've got two really major, big name, popular fights. I think casuals would get into, and oh, yeah. not, I'm not saying casuals in a negative way. I'm just saying people that prefer to watch high level championship fights and don't watch every weekend on the Zone and ESPN and Showbox like we do. Um, for fans like that, you've got Errol Spence, um, unified welterweight champion, Terence Crawford, WBO champion, former undisputed champion um, at 140. They, they were set up to have a clash and things just kind of fell apart at the last minute. And now we're going to get Bud fighting on December 10th, which we'll mention at a later time. We'll get into that a little more. But then you've also got um, Tank Davis. Uh, he's got a baby WBA belt, uh, former IBF and all that stuff. So he's got been a champion. Um, Ryan, huh? You got a Mickey Mouse belt. <laughs> Mickey Mouse belt, them alphabet belts. You know what I'm saying? I can't do nothing with them. And then you've got Ryan Garcia, who's 
by all accounts, an exceptional boxer um, who hasn't really necessarily had those championship rounds, but he's definitely got the popularity and the skill set to be in this conversation. So you've got these two fights. Which one, um, you know, g- give me a quick summary on it. Which one do you see happening first? And I'm not even talking 2022, obviously. So no, what, no. What do you, which one you see coming first? That's the real disappointing thing, right, is that both of these fights were rumored to have been happening this coming month, both of them. You know, it was, yeah. it was a realistic possibility that December was going to be probably the biggest month of the boxing schedule. But because right. of boxing politics, because of how people, you know, uh, want to kind of dictate terms on both sides of these coins, these things mm-hmm. didn't happen. And neither of these fights are going to happen this year. But if I had to pick one that's going to happen first, in my honest opinion, I think that the Spence Crawford fight is the one that happens first. Not because mm-hmm. of preference, because arguably there's a strong argument that can be made that Davis Garcia is a bigger money fight than Spence versus Crawford is. Spence versus Crawford is for pure boxing fans that have followed both of these guys' careers. Neither one of mm-hmm. these guys is a big household name when you talk about uh, corporate sponsorships, when you talk about being in commercials, when you talk about mainstream you know, rappers and artists and things like that who follow and come to these guys' fights. That's not mm-hmm. Spence Crawford. That fight is Davis Garcia all the way. But when That's you right. talk about a fight that can realistically happen sooner, I'm going to say Spence Crawford for one reason and one reason only, because Crawford is a free agent. If Crawford wasn't a free agent, if he was long-term signed to another promoter, both of these fights would be lockstep with the same major issues. Davis mm-hmm. Garcia is not going to happen, ultimately, in my opinion, until PBC is willing to split the revenue, split the broadcast, with his own because his own put too much money and too much into Ryan Garcia, building him up as a superstar, as a guy that can cross over fighter that can get into these national deals. He's got Gatorade. He's got GMC Hummer. He's got major network, you know, sponsorships Mm -hmm. until they're willing to do that. That's not a fight that's going to happen. And it doesn't seem like PBC is willing to concede that Garcia is on the same level with Davis right now. Yeah, I, I definitely can agree with you there. Um, I'd see uh, Spence Crawford probably happening first. In fact, uh, they could get it in before Crawford's mandatory becomes um, ordered in May of next year because that'll be 18 months since yeah. he's a WBA, WBO super champ. So he's got 18 months since Porter. Um, so that gives him time to actually order it. And because it's a unification fight slash undisputed, um, I could see all the four organizations giving time for that to happen, even if Spence does one mandatory challenge, maybe Keith Thurman in January, February, even though that's the worst time to have a fight when you've got Keith Thurman in the mix, Keith yeah. Thurman probably is more popular than Bud and Errol put together. Um, and I think he's, he's going to sell a fight no matter what time of year it is. So I think that'll be your fight in between. So I could definitely see Bud fighting David Avenesian in December 10th, uh, Errol Spence fighting Keith Thurman sometime in January, February, and then early May. Uh, maybe that May Day weekend, if Canelo is in fact by then, somebody we're going to talk about in another episode. Um, I think that fight could happen early next year in the second quarter. So definitely. Uh, but let's get into your wheelhouse, man. Before we yeah. do, we got basketball coming up. Hey, everybody out there watching, man, this is going to be a week, a bi weekly thing here. This is the Mike Check podcast with T Word and Quentin Dame Lilly. Um, that's Q and T on the mic. We're going to do this thing every couple of weeks for you guys. Uh, we're going to talk all kinds of sports. We're going to have the mail back open. Feel free to drop us an email with some information. Follow us on social media. Um, it's going to be the T-H-A Mike check at gmail.com. If you want to send in some questions or some topics that you love to hear us talk about, because we're happy to go ahead and discuss whatever you bring. But that being said, let's talk basketball. You know what I'm saying? I wish I had a graphic come across the screen with somebody dribbling or something. I'm going to come up with something cool, we'll man. Don't there, worry man. about we'll it. Get there, man. We build it. You know? I'm going to get them at his fire. You know what I'm saying? But that being said, Let's talk about the top of the game first. Uh, some some guys that are on legendary paths. Um, they've already laid their legacies with championships, but who needs another championship more? Do we want to say, would you say LeBron or Kevin Durant? It's a tough call, man. And when I thought about this question, right, and when I proposed it to you, that's something we should talk about on the show. I think the one mm-hmm. thing that first came to my mind was is my first thought was LeBron, right? Because LeBron's still chasing Jordan. LeBron is mm-hmm. still chasing Kobe. LeBron still is still chasing, chasing Kobe, yeah. legacy that – goes beyond the guys he's playing against now, right? Like, he's just – he's building his treasure chest to be compared when he goes to retire and sit down and say, look at all the things that I've done, right? Right. He measured up against those guys, and I need to be in that room, so to speak. He's definitely in the room. 
He's not at the mm-hmm. head of the table yet, but he's still in the game, so he can move to that direction. But then you For think sure. about me, and you think about the fact that he left a great situation in Golden State where they had won back-to-back championships. They would have had three in a row if their injury bug hadn't hit them in 2019 when they lost to the Raptors. Um, right. I, I got to say it's KD, man. And the reason why yeah. I got to say that is because he has yet to show that he can be the leader on a mm-hmm. team that wins a championship. It hasn't happened yet. And yeah. I think ultimately, if he doesn't win another championship, I think that that keeps him out of that top 10 all-time list because every other guy on that list will have been the best player on a team where he was the leader, he established a culture, and they won a championship because of him. And he would be yeah. the only guy that wouldn't have that on his resume. So I think that that keeps him out of the top 10 if he doesn't ultimately win a championship, at least with Brooklyn or with someone else somewhere else. So, so I tend to agree with you just a little bit, but I do differ. So while I do believe that he hasn't been the, he hasn't been the culture shifter or culture changer of a team. I do believe everybody in Golden State took a back seat. The problem with saying that is yeah. it was a loaded team. He was just <laughs> the best player on a loaded team. So right. he didn't really, so he was a leader in the fact that they already had a championship culture and they all just deferred to KD because he was a new kid on the block and they wanted to keep him happy and make that investment of energy in him. The crying calls from, from, from you know, between him and Draymond and this and that, they wanted this to pay off. So they had to make him the centerpiece, even though they didn't need him to be the centerpiece. So he didn't shift the culture. He just ended up being a de facto leader. That being said, I 100% agree again that KD needs another championship, not just because he needs more to be closer to LeBron in number, but the fact that he, he doesn't have a signature championship. LeBron has a signature championship. The comeback, the 3-1 comeback is a signature championship more than any other, in my opinion, because it put a stamp on the fact that he has an iconic moment of chasing down the play with the block. Yeah. That's iconic. That's going to yeah. be in highlight reels yeah. for the anytime the finals come on when they play that highlight reel right, of right, championship right. moments. He's in there. KD in don't it. have one of those. That's it. That's he it. don't have one of those. So he needs that moment in order to be moved into that upper echelon. So I can't put him in the top 10 all time of NBA great champions for that reason alone. He just hasn't put his stamp on the team and had that iconic moment to say, I have arrived. And I can retire, and you can't question my resume. LeBron has an unquestionable resume, so I don't think he needs any more championships to be considered an all-time great. He, he's already in that conversation for the last five years. And how many rings has he won over the last five years? You know what I mean? So, I mean, the, the, the interesting dichotomy between LeBron and KD is that they've been battling against each other for 10-plus years now. You know, LeBron came in in 03. Um, KD came in in 07, so they're really mm-hmm. among the same era, even though people really consider LeBron to really be before KD. They're only really four years apart when you look right. at the age difference, when you look at the fact that KD is now entering his mid-30s. You know, it's yeah. really a lot of pressure on him, I think, moving forward to try mm-hmm. and get this last championship because if he does, it raises him into that same conversation with LeBron, with Kobe with MJ, yeah. with Magic, with Bird, with all of the great players that came before him. And right now, he's really in that top 20, top 25 range on my all-time list, which is another thing that we're going to talk about in the future on future shows, so stay tuned for that. But right for now, sure. I have KD in my late teens on my all-time list, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that it doesn't seem like the, the trajectory of teams change because of him. Right. That's, a, that's one thing you can say about LeBron is every single team he goes to, the expectations immediately change to where they're competing for championships. They're in a deep playoff runs the minute that he arrives. I agree with that. Um, I would say the only time I could say that championship expectations follow KD is when they relocated to Oklahoma City. I think the level of the level of expectation did heighten, but I don't know if it was championship, but it went from we're just going to be a good team to we expect to make the playoffs and win 50 games per year or more, 55 games a year or more or more. But championship, like when LeBron comes to your town, you, you go from whatever you were thinking about 
hey, we just want to win 20 games. We just want to make the playoffs. We want to be 500 at the all-star break. It goes to how deep in the playoffs can this team go? Everywhere he's been, that's been the expectation. So I agree with you on that point. Um, I want to get into another one. Um, and then I'm going to leave the last topic for you because basketball is your thing. And I want people to understand where you're coming from. You play basketball and we'll run your resume at another time. But before we get into that last topic, let's talk about Giannis being a top 10 player of his era. And we're going to cap that at the last 20 years. So from 2002 to now, yeah. is Giannis a top 10 player in that era? Well, I mean, you got to roll through the, the the people that come to mind, right, between 2002 and now. So you're talking about yeah. Kobe, Tim Duncan, mm -hmm. T-Mac, LeBron, D-Wade, yeah. KD. You're talking about a lot of guys. That's seven guys I just named just right there. But what I will say is, is I think yes, I think he is already. I think, I think if you were to leave his career at where it is now, if he was for some reason to just up and retire and say, I'm good, I'm done with basketball. I think among his era, he's definitely probably in the top 15 on my list. And the mm -hmm. reason I say that is, is he goes to a small market team that yeah. has no superstars, that has really no culture of winning since – Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wasn't even Kareem Abdul-Jabbar the last time. <laughs> I mean, you got to really think about this. Like, yeah, the last yeah. time the Bucks were That's a Kareem good point. Team, Kareem was still playing, and he wasn't even Kareem yet. Like, you got yeah. to put that into perspective. We're talking about the late 70s here. So, yeah. I mean, to go to a small market team, to go somewhere that not a lot of free agents want to join you, to go there and just really – make it happen there against all odds because we got to remember his championship runs now he's only won one championship but mm -hmm. he's been in deep runs in other two other occasions right he's mm -hmm. he's beaten kd in the nets he's beaten the celtics in a series where they were expected to win um he beat chris paul and the Suns in the finals the year that they won the championship so realistically mm -hmm. i mean he's got a deep resume of guys that he's been able to get over and get over the hump on uh, in right. the last probably really just five years, if you take the last five years of his career. Not to mention two-time two MVP. I mean, he's arguably one of the most complete players in the league right now when you talk about offense, defense, complete package. And the great thing that I like about Giannis is that his motor never stops. And that's yeah. just a skill that you can't teach. You either have it or you don't. Um, and that's hard. Playing hard every night, 82 nights a year, and the fact yeah. that he's he's fought through some you know some minor injuries, he's rarely ever out. That's a great skill to have, and I definitely would say that right now, Giannis mm -hmm. has definitely submitted himself in the top 20 of his era for sure. I would definitely put him in the top 20. Um, I put him right on the edge of the 10, um, but you know I, I go back and you got to think, okay, who's coming to the league since let's say 2000? And that means that they're in like the third year come 2002, something like that, right? But then you start to look at guys like, I don't think you mentioned Kawhi. Um, a, a good part of the Tim Duncan era is in that time frame too. So when you start to just kind of look at the guys who were pivotal pieces of their team, not necessarily the only thing, um, I put him right on the edge. But if you ask me this question in two years, he's going to be in that top 10 because I feel like there's so much more now that he's gotten that ring He's got he can relax. It's like a lot of players when you could get that that monkey off your shoulders, get that weight off your shoulders. You start to play at a different level because you've you've been there. You've gotten there. It's like dudes that have won the Super Bowl are like, man, I've been playing relaxed since I made it to the Super Bowl. I've been there. I know what it takes. I know how to manage my body. I know how to play at peak when I need to and turn it on and off and be the best player my, my team needs. And I think he has that now. And I think in the next couple of years, we can see him right back in the finals and probably winning another. And that's going to catapult him past some of those dudes that I might have over him right now. Um, the last topic, basketball, I'm going to throw it to you. Um, who's the biggest dark horse to win in the NBA, win the championship this year? Like, who, who's your dark horse favorite to, to just sneak up on everybody and win the league? You know, right now, man, it's, it's, it's tough because it's so early, right? So, you know, you have a long season. You've got a lot of factors that are going to go into it. But ultimately, mm -hmm. if you're going to ask me the question now, I'm going to say the Memphis Grizzlies. I think Memphis is in a great spot. Memphis mm -hmm. is a complete team. They know what their roles are. Ja is a superstar, unquestioned superstar. 
I think that they're in a great, great place to really contend and try to get to the finals. I think the West mm-hmm. is one of the tougher uh, uh, conferences to play in right now uh, compared to even the early 2000s Western Conference when you had great teams and, and super loaded teams. I think the West is probably as deep as it's ever been right now when you talk about the Nuggets, you talk about Portland, you talk about Golden State, you talk about the Clippers that are trying to get healthy. You know, you, you're talking about Memphis. You're talking about a lot, a lot of really, really good teams. Phoenix still in the mm-hmm. mix. Um, I think that Memphis got a taste knowing that they can compete with the best players. Because if you think about it, they were really the only team other than Boston that put some fear in Golden State last year. Golden yeah. State was comfortable in every other series outside of Boston and Memphis. And that says a lot to me because Golden State is the most experienced group of players out yeah. in the NBA right now. And I think that Memphis has a lot of confidence. And I like the mm-hmm. dog that they play with. They play with they play with that hard toughness of the Zach Memphis Grizzlies back in yeah. the you know, early to uh, late 2000s, I should say. Um, yeah. But they got the flashiness now. They got Ja. They got a lot yeah. of other players that are playing really well. Desmond Bain has really become a great – I mean, he's becoming like Clay Thompson light. I mean, you got to see this dude shoot the ball. It's awesome mm-hmm. to watch. And I think that that's definitely a team that's going to be, you know, really, really up on some guys' heels that we didn't expect. But one caveat I will put in there is also the Pelicans. The Pelicans are a great team. They're really fun mm-hmm. to watch as well. And so I really would look forward to seeing them and seeing what they can do. They're another team that's in that same realm with Memphis. Young, athletic, plays hard, and they have a great coach as well. So I think that they have a real shot at, at getting to that next level of being a real contender this coming season. Well, you know, being down south and being from New Orleans, I'm, I'm going to hear about the Pelicans because oh, yeah. most Saints fans are Pelicans fans. Yeah. So I've been hearing, you know, how good they are. You know, my, my NBA uptick is right around Christmas. Um, You know, things start to kind of shake out a little bit more. Um, I get my nose really deep into football until that time of year. But I do like to try to just keep a keep an eye. I'm an Oklahoma, Oklahoma City Thunder fan. So for those who don't know, that's my squad. And I just keep a you know, I keep a little distant eye on what's going on. But for the most part, I do like to see who else is competing. And I've always recognized Memphis. Well, not always, but probably for the last 10, 12 years, maybe a little longer. Memphis has been one of those scrappy teams that you have to take account for because they've taken some first round series from teams that thought that they were going to walk over them. So you never can look past the Grizz anyway. So I definitely can see why you would pick them. So that's going to close out all the topics for this week, man. We actually made it through the list. Um, Is there anything you want to share with the people out there before we go ahead and sign off? Yeah, man. I think the one thing that I just want to say is, you know, we're going to, we want to thank everybody that's going to be watching this show. We love input. We love suggestions. We want everything uh, to be as best on this show as possible. And I think that hearing the fans, hearing the viewers and the listeners, uh, feedback is always going to be great. Um, And we're going to be gracious in correcting things that need to be corrected. And when we get things wrong, we want to be able to fix them. So it's going to be really, really fun. I'm really, really looking forward to the guest aspect of the show when we start to have on guests. Uh, yeah. and people that are going to be even better experts in these certain fields and topics that can kind of give right. us some insight on some things. Uh, so it's going to be really fun. Continue to listen, continue to watch, continue to support because that's what we do. So that's all I for can sure. say. Absolutely. Hey, we thank everybody for tuning in again. Um, I'm going to echo Q and say, please send your suggestions in because we want to make this the best show that we can. And that's going to be based on your feedback. You tell us what we can do better, what we can do to make the show greater. And we're going to continue to take your constructive criticism and improve. We're always going to take our time and dig into the topics that we also find most important and the things that you find important as well. So again, this is going to be a bi-weekly show. Drop something in the mailbox. That's going to be T-H-A-M-I-C check at gmail.com. We're right here on YouTube. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. If you have not already, like, share, subscribe. Um, follow us on Twitter. Um, I'm going to make sure that information is in the description of this video so you can catch up with both of us online. Hey, we always somewhere on Twitter chopping it up, whether we're debating each other or, yeah. or, or other people are joining the conversation. Right, and right. they're with us. We're always up for that healthy conversation. Um, and we, all, we, we got time today. 
we always got time for a good sports talk. You know what I mean? And we always keep it respectful. We definitely keep it respectful um, because it's all love between me and my brother here. So until the next time, this has been episode one of the Mike Check Podcast with your boy T-Word, Future Champ, Quentin Dang Lily. We'll catch y'all in two weeks. Peace.